Great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Luke Massa. I'm a software engineer at TripAdvisor. Um, so I'm going to talk to, like, like um, we just said, talked about some the testing framework that we kind of built as we started deploying OPA. So the, our use case for OPA, so we had a few months ago, we have, we've been operating Kubernetes clusters for you know, a couple years now. Um, and we decided that you know, we're, we wanted to do some more and more granular kind of decisions about um, what should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed. Um, RBAC is, is, is good for a lot of things, but there's some more specific things that we want to be able to do. The example that uh, often comes up is the ingress uh, objects, also some sort of stipulating things about pods, um, so all kinds of things. So we decided, looked around, and decided you know, this might be a good framework for us to do this. The problem that I wanted to address, though, was uh, you know, we didn't have any experience in writing these things. We didn't understand the application at all. I was sort of deathly afraid that I would turn it on, and then everything would not be allowed, and then nothing would work. So how do I go from not having this at all to feeling comfortable to, to turning on um, uh, an emission controller? So the sort of the solution that we, we came up with was tests. Um, so first, we the first sort of step to get from nothing at all to some sort of uh, policy that works uh, was unit tests, which Michael talked about earlier. Um, so we used the internal, so I was saying Rego, but is it Rego or Red Joe? Is, does, Rego, okay, so Rego. Uh, so we're using the, inter the existing Rego uh, unit test framework for that, um, and I'll explain how we do that. The next sort of step was we have uh, what I called functional tests in this case, which were we spun up an instance of, of OPA dev instance. We constructed sort of mock um, emission review controller ob or emission review objects um, that Kubernetes would construct, spit them at that, and then see what we get back and expect to maybe um, expect whether they're allowed or denied. Um, and the third, uh, third piece was sort of innovation tests. So we deployed to production, it's running, and then we attempt to create or update or whatever different kinds of objects and see, okay, did these do the things we wanted them to do? So going through that, um, so the first part, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna attempt to do a live demonstration for most of this. So you have to bear with me. So let me see, make these a little bigger. I have two here because the tests take a few seconds to run, and I didn't want to have to wait between them. But cool. So can people see that as it starts to come up? Cool. So what's happening here? Um, so what I wanted to do now is sort of run through the creation of a single policy. So we have this um, repository, we have all of our code in. Um, and so I'm gonna start going through and say I wanted to, so we have, I'm deploying all of this through uh, using Customize with Kubernetes. So we have in our sort of Kubernetes directory, we have a bunch of Customize stuff. We're gonna deploy all these different policies. All the policies leave here one at a time as different, um, as config maps, which is how they're typically deployed in OPA. So this is a, OPA policy as written in a config map that we're going to deploy. Um, and then we have a series of unit tests in, or a series of tests that are going to sort of describe what we want to expect out of, uh, out of the policy. So instead of having to write this out, I sort of walked myself through some uh, talks or some, some, some uh, Git branches as So the first thing we want to do is uh, create a, so this, this down here is just the stub of the policy. Before there was no YAML there, now there is. So now there's just a policy that says, so as I'm talking, I'll run it over here. So I expect this to fail. Oops, test unit. Um, so this is just the policy I expect to write. And then here's the test that I'm, I'm trying to evaluate about it. So I'm gonna make, I just sort of as a silly example, here's a policy I want to make to say that um, I want to allow certain types of names and for namespaces and disallow other ones. So gonna, if you create a namespace with a bad name, we're gonna put, we're gonna disallow that, and otherwise we're gonna allow it. So here is a sort of, uh, this is the language that I kind of came up with in order to express these, these rules. So these, each of these YAML blocks is, is a different test. Um, so the test has a name and it describes what, what, will, what sort of YAML will exist in the cluster after the, the test is run and whether that should be allowed. So this one is allowed because it's a normal namespace, that's fine. Um, and this one was rejected because it has a bad name. So as we ran it here, we see um, this failed. 
And um, so this is, <laughs> I guess, I mean, this is kind of, the, the reason I had it, I decided I kind of needed to go this route in terms of uh, building both, all three of these pieces is that it's kind of hard to debug a lot of this stuff because it's policy language. It's not sort of imperative language. You can't sort of just like raise exception with some data structure in it and what does it look like at that time, right? The, um, you, it's, it's evaluating all the things at once and it's just pull, pulling all things together for you. It's very declarative. So it's hard to sort of tell did this work at all or not or what, what the issue was. So it took a lot of iteration to get there. So I needed a kind of quick framework to go through that. So this failed for whatever reason. Um, so this one particularly because, I mean, it, so it says at the bottom here, we failed just one, and that's because this allow one worked fine, but the reject one obviously failed because there's no policy for that yet. So the next step is to write the policy, which I will now magically do. Um, so the policy here um, is, is some Rego, Rego code. Um, the deny object is something that, that sort of bundles up into whether you reject or accept the uh, emission review control. Um, this describes, okay, is this a, what kind of request is this? Is it a namespace request? And I have a little function down here, which I have misspelled, and I'll see that that will fail, It'll fail to sort of build the, the policy. And then um, this describes, okay, it extracts the name from the namespace. It checks to see, um, whether it equals the bad name name, and if so, then it rejects it with this name, but obviously this all failed. So instead, um, I'm going to check out the next guy, and this should, I expect, oops. I fixed that, and then now this should work for the unit test, and we hope to, for all these to pass. So what's happening under the hood is um, we have, it creates this generated directory, um, and for this example, it just it copies over the exact uh, Rego for Rego for the uh, the test that we want to run here. This is just from from above, and then the sort of more sort of uh, tricky part, or the, the part that took a little more work, um, was I sort of develop or created generated this this code here um, from those YAML files, right? So. It says, this here says, expects input as, and this is the input object that I had before. Um, and this, sorry, this creates the emission review, so it creates the emission review object. Here's the, uh, the request object is, is inside of this, and then it has all the other metadata that Kubernetes is gonna pass along. Um, and so for the ones that were allow, I expect the deny to be nothing, it's meant to be an empty set. Um, whereas for the ones that um, I expect to deny, I have a, uh, deny equals some some other set. So this is this is testing to make sure that given this input I get nothing back, and given this input I get um, this other other aspect back. Cool. So that was the um, the unit test part, and then the next step, like I said, was would be to run it um, against uh, our development instance. So I'll talk about this in a second. What it's doing with the the config maps, but now it's going to go through and each it's going to Run this is actually running against our, our dev cluster at back in, in uh, Needham. So it's running each of these tests, and what it's doing is very similar to this. It's just creating this object here, this emission review controller object. It's posting it at the dev rego, rego, sorry, um, and it's re responding and checking to see what the response is. Um, so here it failed as, as the first one did on the, on the second one, the bad namespace, because it said, this is using um, Python's uh, unit test framework and we're using a library called Parameterize, which allows you to run, to write one unit test and then annotate it and say, actually run this with these 20 or 1,000 different um, inputs. So that's how these are all different. These are all one, written as one policy, but they're fed via, um, via the unit test infrastructure with all kinds of different um, input. So this particular one failed, um, as we said, because it expected false, but it got true. Um, so then the next step is I'm going to apply it to the dev cluster. So this is using kubectl apply. First the dry run and then the not dry run. So that will apply all of those. And then now when I do a test, you'll see it should say seven out of seven. So the first thing I do is I check to make sure. So the way that um, OPA makes sure that it pulls all the policies in is it adds an annotation to config maps as it sees them. And it says, okay, now I've loaded that policy into my, into, uh, into OPA. So, um, 
the first thing I do before I actually run the test is I check to make sure, hey, are all those applied? Otherwise, it's not going to work. Um, so I don't want to, I was having a bunch of things where I would think I was testing, but I wasn't, so that was sort of frustrating. So the first thing is make sure, okay, are all the, in this dev cluster, has everything been applied? If yes, then go through and test all the things. And now as we see, um, these are all passing, so that sounds good, Good looks good in dev. So we'll go ahead and um, run it in production. So we'll do the same thing as before. Um, do it in test, you get a test first and then make sure those fail and then apply with a good sort of test-driven development uh, mentality. Um, so what this is doing is uh, similar in spirit, but for this case, it's actually doing kubectl apply under the hood with the dash dash server dry run um, flag. So in, I believe starting in like 113 in Kubernetes, you're able to pass along a flag that says, do all of the possible things you can do with this uh, that you would do, do RBAC, do, for example, admission controllers, and then just return what you would have done, but then don't persist that to etcd. So it's a super useful way of, of testing things like this because you're able to run it against the real cluster, ask it, okay, what, what, what would you do in this case? Um, and then it uh, can respond for that. So now we see it says, um, just as before, so now we'll do, apply this to production. And by production here, I just mean the production version of OPA, but this is our dev cluster. Um, so now we hope to see the same uh, 7 out of 7, and we hope that it starts passing on that test. Cool. So this, I mean, this, this is sort of a synthetic version of this, but I mean, we can um, show that if I type, you know, at this point, if I type kubectl create namespace bad name, it should you know, deny it with this, uh, given the, so this is, this is exactly what's happening over there and just in dry run mode. So if I create, you know, foo with server dry run, it, oh, we have to do apply, it's a whole thing, but that's fine. Um, but the idea here is that I just don't want to create, I guess I could, I'm not gonna hurt anyone. Um, so I could do this, but I don't want that. But the bad name one is not going to work um, because of the uh, OPA denying this specific request here. So it's all passed, so now we've applied a new policy to our, to our cluster. So going back over here, um, I, kind of, I kind of blew through all of these, but this is the unit test part. Like I said, we use the OPA unit test framework. Um, this next part, uh, where we said we run an instance of OPA, that's the sort of the second one, the dev or the functional. We load, with, we load all the rules up, we construct a mission review objects, we post them at the dev instance, look to see if the output matches what we, we expected. And then finally, after we do apply these changes to our cluster, um, we use the same exact, everything's using the same YAML and, and using the same uh, code under the hood to turn those into what we expect to happen, what we don't expect to happen. Um, then we apply one of those to, uh, to the cluster with the server dry run and see, see what works there. Um, so here are some sort of features as, we, as I went through this, kind of things I wanted to create or wanted to um, implement. So as you saw in the, in the ob objects I said after, um, and the reason I did that is because I wanted to be relatively flexible and be able to say, you know, before the cluster looked like this and after it looked like this, so that way I can test, for example, if I wanted to have rules that um, deny the deletion of certain things or the updating of certain things. Um, so instead of just saying, this is the object, does it work? Um, I wanted to say, you know, this is the state before, this state after. And that was just a straightforward, that's gonna then just be a straightforward mapping from that into an emission review controller. So I could, I thought about maybe we'll just have people write emission review requests, but this is a little bit higher level up, it's a little easier to, um, to reason about and to write, okay, this is what it was before, this is what it was after. But that under the hood becomes the YAML, or the, the JSON that Kubernetes is going to be passing to OPA that we're gonna respond. Um, the second part was sort of context objects, which could be thought of as an after and before, but I'd have to keep writing after and before for each one. Um, these are things like, and I'll show you an example here. Um, these are things like uh, the namespace that a particular object is in might dictate what's allowed in the object and what's not. So if we look at the tests here, um, so this, we have some rules, some sort of high level rules that define, you know, are you allowed to, uh, for what names are you allowed to have host um, ingress? So not only do two of them not conflict with each other, which is something that we were talking about earlier, but also, you know, is this namespace allowed to provide the host for tripadvisor.com or is it only allowed from this one or other names or whatever it is, right? So the, the rules associated with this 
look at the namespace, pull out the label, and I'll show you the rule in a second, but it pulls out these annotations, compares them with the object that's being created. So this is the sort of context object that exists before, and then this is the after object, so this is the thing that will is trying to be created, and this one I'm going to deny, whereas this other one I accept because it lists that, that name there. So this rule is gonna be a little more complicated. Um, So this implements the thing we were just looking at, um, and this pulls out the, the different allowed hosts and makes sure that they match, and then this is just the implementation of, the, of, that, of that code. Um, so then the last thing that I added was the ability to test existing objects, and let me see if that is still working. Um, so the idea here is that, I think it's check existing, we'll say ingress. The idea here is that if you write a new policy for the cluster, that's great, but what do you, how do you know that the objects you have currently in the cluster, because emission review only happens at time of, of, of emission, right? So you could have objects in the cluster, they're not hurting anything, they're just sitting there, but you might not want them to be there anymore, and if someone tries to update them, they might not work or whatever, so you wanna get all those out of the cluster. So this, what this does is, is very simply grabs all of the objects of a certain kind in the cluster, and then one at a time attempts to server dry run create them, and sees whether those, um, those expects those all to pass, right? So as I was adding, pol as I'm adding new policies to the cluster, the first thing I do is, okay, is now that I've written this policy, and that's great, and, I'm like, I'm, and here I'm testing against dev, um, I'm making sure, okay, it, the things I have in the cluster already, are they all going to pass? Um, and I thought maybe eventually I'll put this into some sort of uh, test, and some sort of uh, thing that's running all the time and monitoring the cluster, make sure that um, the, People aren't subverting this in some way. Maybe we made a mistake, or you know, maybe Opal was down and, and it, something got in or whatever. But it'd be nice to have something that's constantly checking to make sure is everything kind of matching our expectations about about our policies. Cool. Yeah. So then, just conclusions. Uh, these are, um, as we were saying, the kind of relatively straightforward uh, software development stuff. Um, writing tests. Uh, you know. As you go is a great way to uh, learn how to codify your understanding of something. Like I said, I came into uh, to this not knowing any anything about policy, anything about um, writing in, in that sort of language. Um, so as I went, it was nice to sort of go back and forth and say, now this I can have this little thing, you know, that's what this does, and, and what is the difference between a function and all these different things in this in this language, which takes a little bit getting used to. So this helps you kind of bootstrap and slowly add on to it, which is fun. Um, and the other aspect, of course, now, I mean, adding a new test is pretty straightforward, or adding new um, uh, policies is pretty straightforward, because, you know, you can write the test first, you can run it, make sure it looks good, so it definitely lowers the barrier of entry. Now, I was talking earlier, you know, we have this issue where our cluster, for various reasons, is not super good at handling um, this flag that's allowed that allows you to run separate containers in the same pod using a shared namespace, um, shared process namespace. Um, so it's, it's allowed in Kubernetes, and then 117, I was talking to someone earlier, they're gonna promote it to, um, it's out of beta, and it's going to be everywhere all the time, but we, we don't want it. Um, so the simple way for us is we'll just write a little policy that says, looks at the pod spec, looks at the point on the pod spec where you say that's true or false, and just say if that's false, you're not allowed. Um, and that's even sort of better than, than turning the feature off entirely, because now we have this nice output that says, um, you know, we accept, you know, the, or I forget where it went, but the idea is that the output, yeah, here it is, 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 it says specifically, this is not a good name, use another name, this could be a link to a doc, this could be anything, that way people have very quick response and says, you know, this is what I expected to happen, this didn't work, um, uh, so. Cool, there you go, all right, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Questions? Hi, uh, yeah, so I had one question about sort of secondary rejections. Okay. Like, yeah, so say you had a deployment that creates a pod, yep. but the pod violates policy. Yep. Uh, have you run into that situation? How, how do you handle? Yeah, that? no, good question. So there's a little bit of debate on my team about the right way to do that. Um, I, I th right now we only just reject the pod. So if you create a deployment, it will allow it, and then you have to, and it won't work, no pods will show up, 
and then you have to look in your events and you'll say, oh, you know, this is not going to work. Um, I think I'd like to also add, and I haven't done this, I probably will, add something that just rejects that deployment as well. Um, the sort of purest argument for against that is because there's deployments, there's replica sets, there's a million ways to do this, and maybe the exact placement of, the, of that particular part of the spec is different in these different kind of higher, higher level objects. So that's kind of frustrating, um, but if you view, in my mind, if you view the, the, pod, the pod rejection as the sort of primary mechanism for preventing things you don't want to do, and then the higher level mechanism is just you know, making it, things a little bit user friend, more user friendly, you can still just as easily write a pod that, or a, a policy that says, given a deployment, look in the spec, and then this, and then that, and then go all the way down to where the, the object would be. So that's, that's, that's definitely doable. Hi, um, I'm curious if, uh, if a single team owns all of your admissions control and the OPA policies, or do you have policy management and development distributed across the, country, the company, and how are you handling that safely? Yeah, great question. Um, so our, we have currently one team that manages, we, so we run uh, several Kubernetes clusters internally, um, so we have one team that manages all of those. Um, and so as far as this is just for, um, for managing um, uh, authorization and, or managing things into the clusters, then it's, it's right now completely managed by uh, that one team. Um, particularly, it, at least right now, most of these rules are not about compliance. They're not about like high level, like what does the organization want to do? They're about us protecting our cluster or protecting namespaces from other namespaces. Um, I could definitely see a future in which people say, hey, I want this certain thing to be true in my, in my namespace, not true in this one or whatever, and they can write these policies, and that's perfectly fine. Um, that wasn't our sort of original intent, but I think that'd be, that'd be cool. Um, but as far as using it, I mean, because the unit tests are all there and because we have CI in, in GitLab or whatever, people can easily make merge requests and, and run them. And as we've gone through this several times, um, the, the dev and the prod parts are super useful, and they're nice to sort of feel warm and fuzzy about it, but for the most part, the unit tests are really catching the entire scope of what's happening. So if someone submitted a, uh, a merge request and it said, you know, I don't want this to happen, and here are the tests that it says it allows, and here's the test that allows the existing things, then that'd be perfectly fine. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool, cool. Cool. Any others? Well, okay, I've got one. I mean, cool. as, as somebody who, who knows the pressure of making sure that policies are right before you push them out, um, I, I love the idea of running policies, going beyond unit testing and pushing them and actually running them on the cluster. Um, are, uh, do you, um, seems that you're running this for validating uh, policies. Yep. Um, and apologies if I missed it, but do you do any mutation? Do, do you do any testing over mutation? And then... And then maybe what's beyond that, if anything? Yeah, no. So right now it's just it's just implemented for um, for the val for validating. So we have other mutating webhooks or mutating webhook configurations in our clusters. Um, those are done. I'm not they, they were done before we had uh, OPA, and I I've tried to get the the guy who wrote those to maybe switch them over, but um, he the there's a little. I mean, I guess it already exists, so there's there's not as much excitement there. But the, yeah, I mean, I can imagine easily sort of. Um, Tweaking this, I, the, the trickier thing is, now, you know, getting it. To, I guess you could just easily ex extend the code I have here. Instead of saying allowed and denied, you say this is the expected response and the expected whatever um, for mutating ones. They're obviously a lot trickier because they're they're changing things and the ordering matters and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I could imagine uh, extending extending this. Cool. All right. So let's thank our right. speaker again. Thanks again.